coming up on Dialogue Weekend. Donald Trump threatens to terminate phase one trade deal with China. We are not happy with China. We are not happy with that whole situation. Will rising tensions over COVID-19 reignite another conflict over trade? China launches new experimental crew spacecraft while the White House drafts a blueprint for mining the moon. Will space become the final frontier for competition? And this week's newsmaker. Now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to this edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinduo. Well, ch chief trade negotiators from China and the United States have uh, had a phone call over the phase one trade deal reached in January. Both sides have uh, sent off a positive tone that they are committed to the implementation of the agreement. The meeting came as tensions between the world's two largest economies have risen in recent weeks over the COVID-19 pandemic. So how is the deal being affected by the pandemic? Is it still on track? And how might the implementation of the deal, or lack of it, affect the bilateral relationship? Joining me with your satellite is Professor Jeffrey Thompson from Peking University. Welcome to our show, Professor. Thank you. So we have uh, the Chinese Vice Premier Liu He and uh, his counterpart basically in the U.S., Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer talking to each other. So why are they having talks now as it's a bit earlier than scheduled, say, every six months since the deal reached? Right. I mean, the deal was, was signed in January. They were supposed to talk in June, six months after. But, I mean, everyone kind of knows, look, there's an issue here, <laughs> you know, the, the targets and the purchase rates. I mean, it was pretty obvious to everyone, look, okay, things have changed a little bit, and we should probably talk and figure out what's mm -hmm. going to, you know, well, what, what, about what we're going to do, what we're not going to do. Right. What about the, you know, is that a response to stock market, you know, because President uh, Trump talked about, uh, you, know, you know, he issued some threats against the deal, so the stock market plummeted, so are they trying to reassure the investors and the business community the deal is on track? It's probably just because the subject was bubbling up. I mean, it was coming from the media, it was coming from investors, it was coming from a lot of people like, you know, what are we going to do about the trade deal? Because obviously things have changed significantly. So it's probably speaking to all of those communities, including uh, the stock market. Mm -hmm. Well, the signal both sides released is that the pact is on track, you know, saying, quote, in spite of the current global health emergency, the pandemic, both countries fully expect to meet their obligations under the agreement in a timely manner. Does any of, the, of them, you know, any sides have any political reasons not to implement uh, the deal fully, say? Right. I think in terms of political considerations, the, this is the U.S. side, that everything in the U.S. and Washington, D.C. is about the election right now. I mean, mm -hmm. it is the only subject in town for the next six months. Uh, we haven't seen any indications that the trade deal as agreed uh, might change in some way because of the election. Uh, but, you know, certainly anything Trump or the White House is saying today is with an eye on the election. Okay, so obviously the two sides, the Chinese side and the American side, they, are, they have every reason to be committed to the full implementation of the deal. Is that a safe to say? Right, I think really, yeah, I think there's two things that happened in January. One is you had the deal, that's important. Two, we started to get around this idea that nobody can trust each other. Mm -hmm. that both sides are very wary of each other. So the last thing you want is for this deal to just sort of peter away because you lose the trust as well. You want this to stay on track, even if it's reset a little bit and retimed, just so both sides can agree, hey, we're making progress, we're making progress. The ability to work together is as important as the terms of the deal. That's right. At least uh, they can build uh, you know, more trust uh, in each other. So as a part of the deal, the Chinese side agrees to purchase 200 billion uh, U.S. dollars more goods and services on top of imports in 2017 from the U.S. But the COVID-19 pandemic, as we have seen, has hit the economies of every country in the world, of course, including that of China and the U.S. So China's economy in the first quarter has shrunk by 6.8 percent. 
So some people are casting doubts, obviously, over the implementation. As one economist has noted, there's no chance whatsoever that the purchasing target will be met. So what's your take on that? I think it's unlikely, although the food purchases are actually on target above what we expected. But overall, everything's down because, you know, both economies are down. Everything's been hit. Oil's been hit. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Uh, so that's kind of expected. I think the important thing would be then for probably the Chinese side to reach out to the U.S. side and say, hey, let's talk about this. Everything's on track, but we need to come to an agreement. It just, you know, operate out of goodwill the same way you would with any partner if something like this happened. Th that's right. I mean, I guess it's also understandable because both sides are facing a lot of challenges. You know, economy is being closed for one month or two months, right? Right. I mean, it's, it's clear that both sides have been hit, but you know, if you had to deal with someone as a business partner and something like this happened, you'd call each other and you'd work it out and mm -hmm. everyone would understand. Right, so that's what we'd expect to see and hopefully that's what's going to happen. But yeah, I mean, nobody's expecting the $200 billion number right now. Mm -hmm. it, it's two years, you know, uh, this year and uh, next year. So that's, uh, that's the commitment here. Uh, if you look at the foods and energy products you mentioned, you know, shutdowns in the American slaughterhouses, for example, could limit the amount of pork, beef, and other American agricultural products available uh, for purchases. And also the price of oil and gas has collapsed. So China has to purchase more barrels to meet the target, while its domestic demand, because of the economic slowdown, has actually decreased. So more challenges to implement the deal, let's say. There's real challenges here. Right. I mean especially the oil and the energy situation is crazy. The prices are so low, how could you possibly purchase that much stuff at this price? I mean, it's, it's just too much stuff. I think one of the areas that you can focus on between the China and the U.S. where, you know, there's a lot of stuff these countries just don't agree on and probably aren't going to agree on anytime soon. One area that everyone agrees on is agriculture. China needs a lot of food. The U.S. produces a lot of food. This is a win-win. So that's kind of the area where I think the U.S. and China can work out something fairly quickly and figure out what the new targets should be. There's not really a lot of disagreement on the agriculture piece. Mm -hmm. uh, well, even on the energy products, anyway, China is uh, the largest market to import uh, energy from either from the Middle East or from the United States or from somewhere else, right? It's, you know, you spend your money. Right, but, you know. Yeah. It's really where you spend your money. Yeah, but I mean, the energy sector got hit too. Yes. Yeah, I mean, the energy sector got turned upside down in its own right, in addition to COVID. So <laughs> that's a pretty crazy sector this week. It is, it is crazy. So in the week of the phone call, President Trump uh, also questioned the uh, deal's future, obviously. Uh, speaking on the Fox News on Friday, uh, Trump confirmed the call took place and said it moves along the deal, but added, I feel differently than I did. So is there any chance he might give up the deal or, you know, scupper the deal entirely? No, I think my take on this in January was that the president wanted to sign the deal and then focus on the election and put this issue to the side for this year. I still think that's probably where he is. and. When he says stuff, you've got you know, I mean, to keep in mind that sometimes he's saying stuff as part of a strategy and sometimes he just says stuff. So I would probably think he wants to keep this to the side, focus on the election, and then maybe this is talked about next year if he gets reelected. Yeah, speak of the ele election, so the deal is also important to his election, right? Right. The agriculture purchases have a lot to do with the Midwest of the United States, which has a lot of swing states in it. Uh, you know, not a lot of this deal was about getting votes in California because he's not going to get any votes in California. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is a political aspect to some of this, sure. Yes. A statement released by China's Ministry of Commerce said the two sides stated uh, they should strengthen macroeconomic and public health cooperation, strive to create a favorable atmosphere and, con con and conditions for the implementation of the first phase of the Sino-U.S. economic and trade agreement and promote positive results. So there seemed to be strong optimism, uh, at least on these uh, you know, uh, top negotiators. 
uh, about the deal. Are you confident the phase one deal will absolutely survive the pandemic as well as probably the escalating tensions between the two countries? Yeah, I think the deal is going to probably be, my guess is they will just postpone it six months. They will just say, let's just forget the last six months. We'll redate it from January to July, and now let's go forward because these six months are just nutty. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably what will happen. It's the easiest solution, and it does keep the deal intact, which is, I mean, that's important that the U.S. and China have come to agreement on some things and should protect that. That's important. Yes, uh, but uh, you know, President Trump has uh, threatened at one point uh, to terminate or impose more tariffs if the deal fails to be implemented. We don't know, you know, what uh, he really meant. Uh, is you know, does he mean the, you know uh, effective and full implementation, or he will not tolerate any delay of the deal? But you know, the sub, uh, circumstances is different. So, is there any possibility that the two countries? Uh, may go back to trade war, or the trade war be restarted somehow? I think the, the sort of underlying tension that's been happening, there's a lot of heated rhetoric these days between the China, China and the U.S. I, I think that's probably going to continue, but, you know, there's this idea that, look, the China and the U.S. don't have to agree on everything. But it's important that, that they agree on some things. We can't have these two countries agree on absolutely nothing. And one of the areas of agreement is the trade deal. It's agriculture, there's some public health, there's some IP protection. This is an area of common agreement, and the world really does need China and the U.S. to be able to work together on some things. Mm -hmm. So I think they're going to protect this trade agreement no matter what, and then we'll probably see some rhetoric on other stuff. Yes, that's right. There's a strong rhetoric in terms of this, uh, you know, in particular uh, for people in a strategic uh, you know, with a strategic consideration, the competition between the two powers. But if you look at the business community, if you look at the markets, you know, Chinese products, they need the U.S. market. And also the U.S. Uh, products, uh, they also need the, the Chinese consumers, right? There, there are a lot of win-wins here. Agriculture is a win. Uh, it's good for Chinese consumers. It's good for producers in the U.S. Some manufacturing is very good for U.S. consumers, great for Chinese manufacturers. Public health is kind of a big win. You know, making lots of masks, sharing medical breakthroughs, that's a win for everybody. There's a lot of these win-wins, and that's the area where you really want the U.S. and China to learn to sort of get along and work together. And then, okay, argue on the other stuff, fine. But there's, there's a good list of these things, the U.S. and China. I mean, another way to look at this is, if there's an area where China and the U.S. agree, like agriculture, that's a big deal for the entire world because these are two very, very important countries that are capable of a lot. And if they can work together on something, that's pretty amazing. And we should, you know, we should try and protect that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, the cooler heads will prevail. Thank you, uh, Professor Thousand. So China's new generation spaceship has safely returned to Earth after completing a series of tests in orbit and the successful launch of Long March 5B carrier rocket becomes a vital part of China's plan to build its own space station. At the same time, the U.S. is accelerating the Moon to Mars campaign. So what's China's next step for its manned space program after the latest rocket and spaceship launch? And how do we see the U.S. space exploration? So joining me uh, very soon via Skype is Dr. Yang Yu Guang, a professor from China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation. But for people who have uh, followed the Chinese space program, it has come a long way, actually. Uh, you know, because China is a latecomer, uh, when people talk about space exploration in particular, uh, competition in the space, you see uh, former Soviet Union and the United States. And later on, you do see also cooperation between Russia, uh, the inheritor of former Soviet Union, and with uh, strong technology in space ex exploration, and the cooperation between Russia and the United States. So, Yu Guan, uh, please tell us more about the mission. How significant is it for China? Well, Qin Duo, uh, you know that our future space station will be a modular design which have three modules, the Tianhe core module, the Wentian and the Mengtian experimental modules. Each module has a mass of more than 20 tons, 
before the Long March 5B, no rocket in China can launch such a heavy payload into space. Although Long March 5 is also belongs to the uh, same family, but Long March 5 usually uh, used to launch the payload to a very high orbit, such mm -hmm. as uh, orbit to the moon or to Mars. So Long March 5B is the first rocket and the only one in China airspace which can launch a payload more than 22 times into low Earth orbit. So you see how important it is for China's future space station program. How do you compare this, uh, you know, uh, Long March 5B to the other space vehicle, you know, by other countries in the U.S. or Russia or the European countries, say? Well, comparing with the capability, Long March 5B now, or Long March 5, uh, is uh, top three in the world. The first one will be, obviously, the uh, Falcon, Falcon Heavy. Uh, which has a uh, uh, capability of launch more than 60 times into low Earth orbit. The second one comes from the uh, Delta IV Heavy uh, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, Launch Alliance, uh, which has a capability of 28 times into space. And the third one will be our Long March 5B. Long March mm -hmm. 5B has a capability to launch uh, more than 22 times into low Earth orbit. So you see that from this view, China is already a very advanced country in the world. Okay, uh, China's space station is scheduled to be completed around 2022, 20, uh, two years ago, with 12 launch missions planned. As the COVID-19 outbreak continues and the economy suffers, as we talked about earlier, so is everything still on track, the plan? Yes, uh, the outbreak of the virus do have many influence and, uh, to us. You see that we come back to work on February and we cannot go to other places like, uh, so smoothly like the Euro days before. So we do met some difficulty. But you see that the launch the day before last is a very successful one. So we have already overcome all these difficulties and made progress and going to uh, the further steps. So you see the next, uh, the, the launch the day before last, uh, the test launch of Strong March 5B is the first one of the top launch you mentioned. So in the coming two years, we will have three launches of Long March 5B, which will launch the three modules into space and assemble them together to form the station. And also, we will have four launches of the Shenzhou spaceship because you know that assembling the space station needs the help and needs the works of the astronauts. And to let them stay in space no longer, we need the launch of four Tianzhou cargo ships to, re to provide the resupplies to them. Mm -hmm. Well, NASA is making some big plans for the U.S. It uh, selected the space firms, including SpaceX, to build uh, lunar landing systems that can carry astronauts to the moon by 2024. And the White House's accelerated deadline actually ended the space agency's uh, moon to Mars campaign. So are we facing a new space competition, say, between China and the U.S.? So what's your take? And also, uh, interestingly, they talked about mining uh, the moon. Well, this is a very interesting topic. You see that from our view, from the view of China Earth space, it is meaningless for us to compete with other countries. You see that China is still a developing country. We develop space technology according to our own needs. So we don't uh, compete with other countries. For this topic, exploration and the exploitation of the moon, all countries should work together and cooperate together. You see, the final goal of the United States is to go to Mars or a manned mission to Mars. But before that, they are always quarreling about how to go to Mars directly or go to the moon first. Uh, the, uh, the roadmap of NASA is to build an uh, outpost uh, near the Cisterlund space called the, uh, the Gateway. But I have already, uh, it is very interesting that I suggested uh, to Mr. G Jim Brittenstein, the administrator of NASA, that for the 2022, uh, sorry, for the 2024 goal, it is not necessary to use the gateway. And finally, you see that they abandoned to use the gateway on the 2024 goal and choose to just develop the, the spaceship, I mean the Orion spaceship, the SLL launch vehicle, and also what you mentioned, the lunar module this time. So they will uh, follow a very similar way like I think. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of mining the, uh, the moon, uh, there is a phrase called like a safety zone, almost like uh, colonizing the moon. And the U.S. is working with its allies uh, without obviously the participation of China and Russia. So what do you make of that? Well, actually speaking, Russia also attended the, uh, the Lunar Gateway, the Lunar Orbit Gateway program. Uh, but it is really a great pity that the China, uh, they, don't, uh, they haven't invited us to attend. Uh, in fact, the, uh, my friends from the United States, including the former administrator of NASA, Dr. Charlie, uh, Charles Borden, also expressed his wish to cooperate with China many times. 
my, oh, many of my friends, including those from NASA, those from the universities and from industry, has expressed their wish to cooperate with China. But at, uh, the current stage is really difficult because the U.S. Congress forbids them to cooperate with us. So it is uh, too early to say how can we cooperate and uh, uh, what we can we cooperate. But we also propose in the future we can cooperate in the uh, in the exploration of the moon, especially a permanent manned base on the lunar surface. And it is very interesting that before uh, this, the United States has already sent their uh, invitation to cooperate with us in the future potential uh, uh, program on the far side of the moon. They want to use our Chiao, our the pipe bridge, uh, really satellites. This, this is a very good start. Mm -hmm. Well, China experienced you know, two launch failures actually this year, uh, March 16th. Uh, for Long March 7A rocket and April 9th for Long March 3B rocket, which shows the high stakes of the spaceflight causes. Here, the SpaceX in the U.S. is conducting more tests on recycled rockets. So what can be learned from the U.S. approaches uh, in terms of uh, space exploration? It is really unlucky that we suffered these two failures. But you, have, you already mentioned the space activities is, is still a very risky field. So it is very natural to see these kind of uh, failures. You cannot ensure 100% safety or 100% uh, percent, uh, success rate. So for any countries, for any missions, for any rockets, it is impossible to ensure the 100% uh, percent reliability. So in the future, we just learn the, uh, learn the lessons from these uh, failures and we will promote our uh, launch vehicles and also we will uh, increase their reliability. Today the success rate of China's uh, carrier rocket is already very, very high in the world and uh, in the future we will continue to promote that. Mm -hmm. How do you compare the two different systems uh, currently? It seems to be uh, in the United States for example they included uh, SpaceX and other private firms but in China it's mostly the state supported, the state led uh, uh, you know, space exploration efforts here. Uh, I, you know, compare the, you know, them with, uh, to, you know, for us uh, with the advantages, the disadvantages, for example? Well, you see that it is very interesting in, in these years, the private companies also enter this, the space field in China. Just the last year, the, uh, the, the first private company uh, made the successful launch of the, uh, which is called the Parabola 1 into orbit, the first uh, uh, orbital launch vehicle achieved by a private company. Uh, so I was just in the Jiuqian Satellite Launch Center to watch this launch. Very impressive. So in the future, I believe the private companies in China also can do more things than, the, than before. And uh, to comparing with, this, with the United States, I think that uh, both the uh, private companies in China and the U.S. can bring more in innovation in this field. And innovation is very critical for the uh, advance of technologies and for the, uh, reducing the cost in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Yu Guang. So let's leave it there for now and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. Blair, uh, Blower, to know more about uh, Dr. Rick Bright. I'm joined by Mario Cavallo, uh, founder and CEO of M Communications Group, uh, who is also a non resident senior fellow of the China Center for Globalization. Welcome to the show, uh, Mario. So, the whistleblower, Dr. Rick Bright, officially filed a complaint this week. Are you surprised by any of his allegations uh, in the complaint? Thank you, Chindua. Great to be back. I'm sorry to say that I'm not surprised by the allegations. You know, the problem with the situation regarding the viral outbreak is that many people like myself over the, and this goes back a long way, this goes back 20 years, we've seen problems developing in the United States in the way the country is run. And I don't just mean under the Trump administration. We've seen a cronyism toward billionaires and away from really taking care of the people. And that problem has shown itself. You know, the virus has shined a light, shown a light, I should say, on this problem where, again, the billionaires are being, belt, uh, the billionaires are being 
bailed out. The people are not really being helped. Mm -hmm. Uh, other administrations have also been guilty of cronyism and favoritism in this type of corruption, and we're seeing it in the Trump administration. But now we have with Dr. Rick Bright, who is a hero with his qualifications as a leading expert in virology and vaccines, but instead we have the revelation of even more cronyism and uh, favoritism that's happening. So we know it's real, and he provides some proof of that. It's a shame. Well, the uh, complaint presents an overall lack of action at the top of the Trump administration, uh, even as the virus was spreading around the world. Uh, judging on what has happened in the U.S., so it seems there's uh, indeed a lack of preparation, uh, to say the least, by the uh, U.S. government. Uh, so is that the case? Well, when you talk about a lack of preparation and a lack of action, in terms of lack of preparation, we immediately, historically, are always going to remember in the history books what's going to go down is the famous February gap. The Trump administration and other officials were duly warned and informed by China, by the WHO. And by the way, even the CDC, who was on the ground in China, by the, end of, uh, by the end of December, and then again by the end of January. It was just an ongoing progression. All information was shared, and still this lack of preparation went on fecklessly for weeks and weeks and weeks. But I want to talk about the lack of action because I want to make a comparison. I mentioned Dr. Rick Bright. He's a hero. Well, the heroes here in China were the healthcare workers who went to Wuhan. I met one today. Dr. Wang Yang from mm -hmm. Zhongda Guke Hospital here in Shenyang. He had just returned back from Wuhan. He was one of the 30,000 who took action, who went to Wuhan specifically and only to save lives. No politics, no cronyism, no questions and discussions about economics in press conferences. That's action, and that's what we need more of. Well, uh, Dr. Bright raised the alarm, obviously, uh, early on in January, along with uh, his dire prediction and urgency. But he's ignored, you know, his uh, proposal met with uh, indifference and rejection. Uh, so it, can we say if the Trump administration you know, acted upon his suggestion by producing masks and researching for life-saving medicines, do you think the situation would be different now? It's more than obvious to be able to say that had any government acted sooner, that the situation wouldn't be as bad as it is now. And the part that's baffling is, we look at the time frame first where the virus broke out in Wuhan, which was in China, and through the days of December and then through January, Remember, the scientists didn't know what they were dealing with. It was brand new. They had never seen it before. There was no forewarning. But by the end of December, China announced clearly, and the WHO did, we have a problem. We're not sure how bad it is yet, but we definitely have a problem. The world was informed. By the, by the famous January 20th, the, right before they decided to lock down Wuhan, they said, now we know from the research hey, this thing does have human-to-human -human transmission. We are in a lot of trouble. It's so bad that we are going to lock down Wuhan and we'll lock down Hubei. So you now are informed. Take action. Look at the size of the action we're taking. Obviously, that implies you should take action. Would everything be better That's had right. they acted sooner? Well, of course, the United States should have done obviously, that. Obviously, you it's know, the very administration was warned, but they failed to take the action. So with that, we are coming to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingzhou. You can find me on Twitter. Thank you for watching. See you next week.